the voice of Jesus say, Come on to me and rest. Lay down your weary one, lay down thy head upon my breast. I came to Jesus as I was. experience that light in our life and we'll have that confidence of knowing that we can walk with you for the rest of our life on earth in preparation for what you have prepared for us in the world to come. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So now Lynn's going to come and read to us from the book of Romans. Romans chapter 14 starting at verse 10. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister or why do you treat them with contempt? For we all will stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God. So then, each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or, block or, 
obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. I am convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person it is unclean. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy someone for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what you know is good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and not to mutual edification. Do not, and to mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or to do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall. So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself by what he approves, but whoever has doubts is condemned if they eat, because their eating is not from faith, and everything that does not come from faith is sin. So when we come to talk about that passage in a minute, Chan's going to come and lead us in another song at this point, Speak, O Lord. Um, when we come to talk about it, we're not going to be talking primarily about food. Because <laughs> food, although it was the example in the package, it, or, and although it's a subject very dear to my heart, um, uh, the, although it's the subject of the passage, it isn't really the principle of what's in the passage, it was the particular issue that Paul was using as an example. Um, and, but I think there's a lot in what he's saying there that can be really helpful to us in thinking about our attitudes towards things and the way and the things that other people do. Right, so let's sing this this as a, a prayer, shall we? Which it is. Thank you. 
We can have more heating on if people want it. Jean, do you want more heating on? You're right. <laughs> okay. So, Romans 14. So, in this, Paul is addressing the issue of Christian brothers and sisters criticising each other. Yeah, why do you judge your brother or sister? And um, I have to say at different times and probably all of us have known times when perhaps we felt that other people look at us and criticise what we do and think that what we're doing doesn't live up to their expectations. Or perhaps we've even found ourselves looking at other people and thinking that perhaps their behaviour doesn't live and the things that they do doesn't live up to our expectations. And uh, we're challenged, why do you judge your brother or sister? Why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. And he's basically saying that each one of us is individually accountable to God for our behaviour. So, um, it doesn't mean to say that we don't ever speak and say, actually, you know, there's something wrong there that's different from judging. There's a, a sense in which we can kind of lovingly guide people into uh, right things. But this is judging things which we, we just think are, are wrong, because perhaps because they're just not the way we do it. He says, for we will all stand before God's judgment seat. And he quotes in scripture, it's written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, Every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God, so then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. I have to say, I find the thought of this each of us giving an account of ourselves to God quite difficult to think about. What form does that take, given that we know that we're forgiven? We come and we know that when we come to the mercy seat of God, that we come from a status of being forgiven in Jesus. And people, we, we know that there's all these kind of folklore ideas of what happens almost that you get to there and God's got a tick sheet of all the good things you did and all the bad things you did. And there's a sort of balance of what's, where, did, where, where on the scales did you did you fall well if we look at it that way and if we had any sense of god's holiness we'd know that if he did things that way we would all fall on the wrong side of the balance um, and actually as believers when we come there what there is is jesus died for you yeah and that's on that side and there's nothing that you can do to put on the other side to outweigh it yet yeah, from that balance if we've accepted him as our savior and put our trust in him then it's that's kind of but somehow we're to give an account of ourselves to God. Um, I remember at one time, and some people have heard me say this before, but um, sometimes people talk about things that happen in life that are difficult that they don't understand. And um, I've heard lots of people say it, not recently. They say, When I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God about that. <laughs> yeah, you heard that, yeah. and um, I, I remember. Um, um, thinking that, and uh, it was dealing with the aftermath of when Dougie had died, and in my heart I'd said something about, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask about this. And it was one of the times when I heard a really clear voice of the Holy Spirit that said, when you get to heaven, it won't be me that's giving account. <laughs> mm, wow. <laughs> that actually when we arrive at God it's not us asking God to give account for all the things he did actually the sense of what happened um, and, uh, and life and perspective will fall into place and we will we'll see it 
And I think that we need to understand that this life is a preparation for us ruling and reigning with God in heaven. That's what the Bible tells us. It's a preparation for that. So whatever happens in this discussion is part of that preparation rather than a, a judgment in the sense of are you in or are you out it's part of that preparation that's the way I think about this conversation with this first conversation with God as we come to the pearly gates or however it looks in in this way so um, but the point that Paul is making is each of us are accountable in our own right for our behavior to God and it isn't our job to judge each other. And this is something that in, in our history, sadly in church history, has been lost completely. And there was all kinds of, we can see back in the Middle Ages where um, groups of so-called Christians tortured other groups of so-called Christians, trying to get them to repent of their views now so that they would be right before God. And um, there were so many different sort of views of that. And I find it one of the most troubling things that when you look at the Reformation, and there was a clear sense in which the reformers saw such a set of truth looking at the Bible and saying, hang on a minute, what we've been taught is nothing like what it says in the Bible. And then having grasped that, were nevertheless still part of, or many of them, perpetrating violence on other people. I find that really, really hard to understand. And it teaches us that although God can show us things in our life, we're still all frail, weak human beings who can be um, blind to other areas of sin. And that, um, that sense in which we, we do all need to be constantly, um, constantly aware that uh, we, what seems obviously the right thing to do for us may not be the right thing in God's eyes. And then he goes on to use the example of food. Sorry, let me go. Therefore, he says, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. Isn't that a lovely thought? that actually the most important thing about the way that we relate to one another is that we don't put obstacles or stumbling blocks that make it difficult for other people to grow in their faith. So there's, there's nothing about coming to us to a church on Sunday morning where people come in and feel, oh, I'm really uncomfortable uh, because, of, uh, because of something, yeah? And maybe it's because... They think they can't sing very well, or maybe it's because they think their clothes aren't very smart, or there's something about them that they think uh, isn't there and feel that everybody's looking at them and looking down on them because they don't quite fit in. But it's our fundamental responsibility that who, wh whoever uh, comes to us, that we've never, looking at them in a way that puts a stumbling block in their way, that makes it difficult for them to come and to make it, it makes them feel embarrassed. And little things can be part of that. Um, you know, um, I always, uh, you probably noticed, uh, um, if somebody arrives late, you try and be gracious and say, come in, come in, be welcome. Not, why have you arrived late and disrupted us? Yeah, because the, because what you don't want is someone to think, oh, it's already quarter to, I'm going to be three minutes late, I won't come. Because um, now, you know, I would encourage everyone to get here on time, but I would encourage everyone, but if you're not here on time, come a bit late. Because I'd rather you were here five minutes late than not here at all. And we're here to give you a welcome five minutes late, even though getting here at the right time would be better if you can. But... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and there's all sorts of reasons, you know, there's all, and we, we don't know, we don't know the reasons why people might, might be late, and um, I know in the room there's various people who for different reasons, um, have, uh, it's difficult to get out on time, but don't, you know, I'm just saying the important thing is that we don't make that a stumbling book, or block, oh I'd be late and everyone's going to look at me when I, when I walk in, we will, but hopefully we'll look at you with a warm welcome and say, come in and make yourself at home, <laughs> yeah, 
um, that's just that's just an example of something practical that uh, that that we uh, encounter, isn't it? That sometimes things are going to happen that we're going to arrive a bit late. You remember a time when you you wouldn't have dared to go into church not wearing your suit and tie, <laughs> and that if you'd gone in, oh, sorry, or as a man not wearing your suit and tie and your hat as a lady, if you hadn't got your hat, you wouldn't. Have, the men had to take their hats off. Yeah, yeah, you couldn't possibly go in with a hat on if you were a man, or go in without a hat on if you were if you were a lady. And those, and if you did, everyone would be looking. Oh, where's a hat? Oh, he's got a hat on. And um, you know, it's uh, it, well, it was it was a set of expectations. And I think that is exactly the sort of thing that Paul was talking about. And there are reasons why people genuinely believe that they should wear a hat in church. And I don't, and there are reasons why people believe that men shouldn't wear a hat in church. And those reasons can be respected. But um, Paul was living in a world where there were reasons why people thought they should eat and not eat different food. And um, he was giving the example of some eat only vegetables and I don't think this was touching on the current trend in vegetarianism which is mainly concern about animal welfare and the planet but that um, for people from a Jewish culture the whole principle of only eating food that was clean and had been prepared in, in accord with the Jewish food laws was very important and that if you were in a place where you couldn't guarantee kosher food, the safe thing to do was to eat vegetables. And um, I think that's still the case today for Jews travelling around the world, that if you can't go to a kosher restaurant, then if you eat vegetables somewhere else, then you don't really touch on the issues of cleanness or, and uncleanness which are about. So, uh, but, you know, Jews will go and find a vegan restaurant uh, because the vegan restaurant won't have had either meat or milk in it, so it won't have uh, had any any risk of the mixing of things. So, you know, today Today, that can be a practical way for Jews to deal with these things and uh, the culture Paul was writing to in writing to the people of Rome was people with a mixture of there was Jews he was writing to Gentiles who he was writing to Jews living in a Gentile world and Jews who had become Christians um, um, coming into the church with this culture of, about clean and unclean food and um, you can see that those who think genuinely that actually we've got to stick to the food laws could be very, you can imagine them being very condescending to the people who were there, took it into their pork sandwich or whatever it was that, 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 that they had, which would seem absolutely disgusting to them to, to, them to eat. And so um, clearly this is the sort of issue that Paul was talking about but he was only talking about it as an example because he says I'm convinced being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself but if anyone regards something as unclean then for that person it is unclean so if um, you know if we believe there are some things that we should eat and some things we shouldn't eat from our conscience then we should stick to that because if we set about and eat them, then, then we'd, be, we'd have a conflict of our conscience. It would be wrong to us. Yeah? And um, if we think that there are some things we should wear and some things we should not wear. Looking around, there's all, a lot of ladies wearing trousers <laughs> in church this morning. Um, <laughs> now, there was a time... <laughs> where you wouldn't dare be seen out in men's clothes in a church, wasn't there, Jean? Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Um, and people would have regard. I mean, it would have been quite shocking to turn up in, uh, in, ch in church in, in a pair of trousers. And then people started wearing trousers and realised they were quite practical and, uh, and warm and comfortable and kept your legs warm. And these days we don't think trousers are, uh, are men's clothes, not women's clothes. But on the other side, it's still kind of looked at slightly strangely where men wear a dress. So maybe there are, you no, know, but men may prefer to wear, uh, wear, wear a dress. But there is a different... Uh, 
But there's nothing fundamental about it at all. There's nothing essential to that. But people's attitudes made it, made, made it something that people would feel uncomfortable over. And in a day when you couldn't go into church wearing trousers, you know, I can imagine that there would be some ladies who would feel very uncomfortable going in with their legs showing or something like that and would find the whole idea of wearing a, a dress very difficult. The whole thing of modesty and what people think about modesty comes into it. I remember on our first trip to India, we had um, uh, a young lady with us um, who was wearing very modest clothes, wasn't she, Anne? Yeah, she was wearing kind of dresses down to about here. But in the part that we were in, you could see people, you could see her ankles. <laughs> yeah, that was quite shocking because her ankles were on display. Now that's changed a lot now. It wouldn't be shocking in, in India now. But it was really shocking because none of the clothes that ladies wore in that culture left their ankles on display. They either wore the Punjabi suits, the trouser suits or saris that went right down to the floor. Now when, when you stepped out of um, the middle class environment of that city, and went into the tribal villages, then the saris only ever came down to there if they had a sari, and a lot of people's body being on display was extremely common, the people were very poor, and nobody thought anything about it, it was completely different. But there was this thing of, gosh, you can see her ankles, and there was something immodest about ankles being on display. These things are so much cultural, and in line with what, what, what are people's expectations <laughs> and we're not to judge each other or make life difficult because people don't meet our expectations if your brother but on the other hand if your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat you are no longer acting in love so if we have people who are who really believe that we shouldn't be eating um, animals you know watching somebody sitting and, and um, uh, picking a chicken bone might be extremely difficult. We've seen this in, in, in our family. It's actually very difficult for them to relax at a, a meal watching people picking the meat off, a, off, off an animal. And um, that, it, that there's a sense of actually. Poor children giving her a hug with needs for You can see, you know, actually, that there's a sense in which what you're saying is that insisting on your liberties you, it's not wrong what you're doing but actually when exercising your freedom makes somebody else uncomfortable then actually <coughs> carrying on exercising your freedom can be an unloving thing to do and that love trumps everything in terms of our considerations as to what we do and that uh, exercising our personal freedom. So recognising that it is a personal freedom and a personal choice and then laying it down and saying, nevertheless, out of consideration, because I don't want to make this difficult for somebody else, then I'll choose not to do that and I'll choose to... He's talking about food in this case, but that might equally apply to, uh, to other things as well. And so the whole thing of being liberated uh, people who know that it's okay to come to church without a hat on. I can see you all think that, looking around, that it's okay to come to church without a hat on. If you were to go to an environment where everyone really believed that it was right that ladies wore head covering in, 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 uh, in church, and certainly um, when we've been to India again, that would very much be the fact, and they wouldn't dream of going out without the, the sari covering their head. It was part of the culture. Um, for me, it was potentially disrespectful not to follow the same line because you have a freedom <coughs> and now you have a freedom to say although I know I'm free not to wear a hat or not to wear particular things or not or to, when I go into this environment I don't want what I'm wearing to be a stumbling block to the people who are there and that when I'm talking to them they're looking at me and thinking why is he wearing something that's inappropriate or why is she wearing something that's inappropriate because you want them to be focused on what it is that is the ministry that you're bringing to them. So, and then he says, do not let what you know is good to be spoken of 
as evil. So it's okay to be clear about your view and then to lay it down. And, uh, and so on. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Isn't that lovely? That, that the sense that we're together um, in the kingdom, being led by the Holy Spirit, and that in that we're to experience God's righteousness, we're to experience peace and joy from the Holy Spirit. And that these things about what we do, what we eat, what we wear, all of these things are completely subsidiary to that. And we can submit to one another on those things in love, yeah, in order to have a harmonious relationship with one another. Now in maturity, then actually we should be in a place where no, actually we can acknowledge all of those things and accept them and welcome them yeah and uh, that we can all be different and uh, as mature believers we can not either have to be offended by what someone else does or offend by insisting on doing what we want to do that we can actually be the one who isn't offended and who doesn't offend because we act out of love for uh, each other rather than anything else because anyone who is who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. That's interesting because sometimes when we're pleasing to God, um, we don't receive human approval. But actually, when we're people who know we have freedoms but don't insist on exercising them, yeah, and um, will submit those freedoms to to be sub respectful of others, then that also gains us honour in the sight of people, as well as in the sight of God. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. That's a lovely sentence, isn't it? Yeah, so that we're here to build up each other. And um, do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food or anything else. All food is clean, but it's wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble so don't do something that you feel is wrong in your own conscience and don't do something that causes someone else to stumble and uh, those are the, the the clear principles that are being set out here and it's, it's better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall so whatever you believe about these things keep between yourself and God blessed is the one who does not condemn himself by what he approves. So there's just, I think there's just a lovely freedom there about personal conscience and the idea that something that is right for one person is wrong for another person. And that's kind of the opposite of legalism, isn't it? And people like laws and to say, this is right, this is wrong. And actually we're saying, actually, What's right for you might not be right for me. What's wrong for you might not be wrong for me. And if we're not talking about basic principle, we're talking about just the way things are done, it's fine. And we have to acknowledge that that's the same for everybody. And of course that can be all kinds of things of style. You think of the things that people um, sometimes find difficult. Do we? What's the type of music that we use? Is it loud? Is it quiet? I mean, um, we you know, we have what we can do. Um, but uh, when you get to um, sort of bigger churches with uh, different <coughs> things, then people can get ever so upset about all sorts of things about music. Yeah, music can be ever so divisive in, in churches. Um, when I preached at Bunyan uh, the other Sunday evening, Jan said to me afterwards, well, that was a great organ, but it was incredibly loud for 20 people because all you could hear was the organ. It didn't matter. There wasn't any sense there was a congregation. It was so loud. There wasn't any sense there was a congregation singing because the organ, which was played well, yeah, because the organ overcame it. Yeah. And um, you'd say, well, no, that, that, they were happy. That's fine. Yeah, not, not our problem. They were, they were quite, quite happy with that situation. Um, 
um, we would always say, let's try and have it so the musical accompaniment is an accompaniment to the congregation rather than something that dominates and you can't hear each other. It's got to be loud enough that you can follow it, yeah, but not so loud that you can't hear the other people. And that's actually an incredibly difficult balance to achieve um, uh, in, uh, in many situations. But so music can be another example. But blessed is the one who does not condemn himself by what he approves. But what, whoever has doubts is condemned if they eat, because their eating is not from faith. So if you don't, if you're, and this applies to other things, if you eat something thinking, well, I've got to do this because other people are doing it, yet even though I don't think it's right myself, yet Paul's saying that, don't do that. If you don't think it's right yourself, don't do it. It can be right for other people, but don't do it if it's not right for you. And for some people that will be, it's not right to go to the pub, whereas for other people it will be. Um, and it's fine, it's fine always round. But then he says, everything that does not come from faith is sin. And this alludes back to saying we're here to lead a life of, of righteousness, joy and peace in the Holy Spirit. Because the Christian life is about constantly being led by the Holy Spirit. Um, I shared an analogy in the Bible study on Sunday that had just come to me while I was driving and I found quite, quite helpful really. Because if you think about a legalistic framework, people, um, pe people, and you think about the environment Jesus was ministering in, there were the Pharisees who were studying the detail of the law and had come up with these plans that say, you need to do this, you need to do that, everything else is wrong. and. Um, you know, a very fine legal framework. As I say, when um, we had some friends who ran a kosher hotel, and in order to say there shouldn't be any unnecessary work done on the Sabbath, they used to tear off the loo paper before the Sabbath to make sure that nobody had to unnecessarily tear loo paper off the roll on the, on the Sabbath day. Um, so they'd taken a sort of, um, the principle of a day of rest to incredible lengths of, of what we would regard as, as legalism. Um, and, but they wanted a set of rules that define what they have to do and what they have not to do. As Christians, I believe what the Bible gives us, and we need to evaluate it, is a set of principles which the Holy Spirit then leads us to applying in daily life. And it struck me that when we learn to drive, we go off and we have driving lessons, for most of us probably a while ago, um, we have driving lessons and we learn how to drive and we pass a driving test. And in the process of having driving lessons and learning how to drive, we learn the principles of driving. We learn that you need to drive on the left-hand side, that you need to look in the mirror and indicate before you change lanes or turn, where you need to give way, what you need to do on a roundabout, all of those principles. And you could come back from your driving test and someone could say, oh, you've passed your driving test, will you take me to London now? And in the old days, um, you, you might have said, well, I've got no idea where London is. You know, um, I've absolutely got no idea how to get to London. I bet you've passed your driving test, but all the driving test had done was giving you the principles. When it came to say, how am I going to use these principles to get from A to B? First of all, to know where I'm supposed to be going and secondly I need to know how I'm going to how I'm going to get there and I remember I did a lot of driving long before the days of sat nav and I still not to be try not to be totally dependent on sat nav although it's really useful and I've been going to visit a client in London uh, or the London area and before I set out, which would usually be in the early and dark hours of the morning, before I set out, I'd have looked at the map to work out how I was going to get to the part of London that they were in, and you'd look at the big map to get to the right part of London. And then you look at the A to Z and try and memorise the A to Z, that when you come off this A road at this place, then you're going to go along here until you see that, and then you're going to go there. And it was, it was quite a matter of pride to try and remember the route so that I could get to the door without having to look at the map. Um, the reality was that quite often you'd find yourself 
uh, actually um, in a traffic in traffic fortunately there was always traffic in cities so there'd be time you had to stop when you're grabbing the a to z off the passenger seat and looking at it trying to fathom where you are in the plan that you've set out for yourself and if you're still in the plan that you set out for yourself or whether you've deviated and where and where you might be and how to get back to where you wanted to go but all the time you had to use rules and knowledge to get you there and only what you could read and see and learn from the book was what was available to you and then along came these things called sat nav and now there are people who trust totally in the sat nav and get in the car and just say i'm going here and go wherever it tells them and um, if something goes wrong and they haven't, they haven't got a clue where they are or which direction they're facing <coughs> or anything um, um, but uh, they just need to tell it where they want to go and it tells you how to get there and there's this voice turn left it and you miss it it's wonderful you miss the junk turn and it just readjusts the route it used to say recalculating and take hours before it gave you a new route but these days with faster uh, processes and everything instantly it just redraws the map and gets you to to the right place and it struck me that in a way that's like the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives, that we're to be people who know the principles. The sat nav doesn't tell you to drive on the left, to stop at the traffic lights, to give way at the roundabout. It doesn't tell you any of those things. You need to know those. Those are the principles that you need to apply. But it does tell you how to get from A to B, applying those principles. And in a way, that's the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives, that we hear him and we hear his voice speaking to us and say, showing us where, what we need to be doing and how we're to do it. And when inevitably we deviate and get it a bit wrong, he shows us how to get it back again and get back onto the right course. And it's living by that voice that comes from faith. And that's why Paul has been talking about it being personal, because we, we have personal things and what's right and wrong is different. And if we act out of line with what the Holy Spirit's telling us to do, then it's sin, yeah? It wouldn't be sin for somebody else, but it's sin for us, because it's not what God is actually asking us as an individual to do. And that's in many ways, I think, a distinctive of Christianity. I think that without being an expert on other things, I think that in, in, in other faith systems, there would be a set of systems that said, this is right and this is wrong. And you're either one side or the other of that. But here we have a situation that says, we've got a set of principles. And within those principles, the Holy Spirit guides us in ways that are right for each one of us. And what's right for you is, is not necessarily right for me and what's right for me is not necessarily right for you and that we're to look at one another and accept each other in that way and accept anyone who comes in among us in that way as well and uh, that seems to me uh, a set of principles to have uh, an environment where anybody should be able to come in and feel welcomed and accepted as they are even if they're wearing jeans. <laughs> <coughs> I remember when I first, the first summer, when I started coming to the chapel again, feeling free to wear shorts to church. I wouldn't wear shorts when I'm leading because it might put other people off. <laughs> but being in the congregation, um, feeling, and you think, why not? But, but it was quite, you sort of had to overcome it. I can't wear shorts to church. <laughs> and why not? You know, and there isn't any reason. Why not? This is not made somehow wrong by having um, knees on show. <clears throat> Lord, I thank you that you guide each one of us within your principles and you show us what's right for us. And Lord, we pray that as we come to our time of communion, that we will be ready to hear your voice speaking to each one of us. I ask this in Jesus' name. It's just as I am, okay. It's the piece of paper's in the book at the right place, Jean.
This hymn reminds us that we, we come and are able to come just because of Jesus' blood shed for us. Not, there's nothing else that we can hold up as recommending ourselves to God, but that Jesus' blood was shed for us. Two tunes. I've put for the second one, Jean. Oh. That's the one? No, it's sorry, the one you just played. Is, is that? Oh, that's it. Prove, 
here for a season, then above, O Lamb of God, I come. Lord, we know that your love is shown to us in unmeasureless way in the death of Jesus on the cross. And Lord, as we come, we say we want to live our lives proving your love every day, trusting in your love, living out your love. We know we're here for a season before being united with you. And so, Lord, we pray that as we take communion, you will help us to draw closer to you and to allow you to reign in our lives more and more. <coughs> I wonder, there's a prayer on the screen. I don't want to ask people to recite things um, without having a chance to look at it. So perhaps you might take a look at the, the prayer. And if it's something that um, we're going to, I'm going to pray it in a minute. And if you feel this is a prayer you can join in with, then um, please do so. Lord, I come to you today not asking for forgiveness because we know that our sins are already forgiven through the death of our Lord Jesus. We acknowledge that in spite of your love for us and the provision of your Holy Spirit to guide us, we still fall short of your standards in the things we do, say and think. Lord, we ask that as we take communion today, you will show us anything we need to change in our relationship with others and help us to become more like you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Can we get the communion things out onto the table? Well, that's probably the best thing, is it? Sorry. I'm thinking that's what we usually do, but it doesn't really matter what we usually do. Thank you. Let's, um, sorry. Sorry. I'm rushing the, the, don't worry, Lynn. Let's take the bread, that's right. Let's t each take a piece of bread, shall we? And then I'll read this passage of scripture that's on the screen in front of us. That's a great reminder that there isn't a right and a wrong way to do it. scripture we're about to read is Luke's account of when Jesus introduced um, what we now call communion to his disciples. He says, when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and he said to them, I've eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, because this was just before, on the night before his crucifixion. If I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. And then in um, 1 Corinthians, Paul tells us, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so, 
at this first communion, the disciples were gathered around a table, not a table as we imagine it, but a table that you lay on the floor and was in front of you, something that I find quite hard to imagine, eating a meal, laying on the floor with the table in front of you. And in front of them were various cups and, um, and so Jesus took the wine and he, divide, he said, divide this among you. And he said, put it around. So it was shared out into each one's cup around the table. So in a sense, that's already been done for us because the wine is in individual cups on the table in front of us. And we're going to pass that round in a minute. And then he took the bread and he broke it and he gave thanks. So let's take the bread and give thanks for the body of Christ broken for us. Lord, we thank you that you gave your body for us. That you care so much for us that you went through the suffering of the cross. That your body was literally broken. And Lord, we thank you that you've joined us together as your body here on earth now, the body of Christ, the church. And Lord, we pray that you will help us to love one another and to love others in other parts of the body in the way that you have taught us to do. And that the principles that we've thought about today in our message might be applied in our lives when dealing with one another. We ask it in Jesus' name. Before we pass the cup round, would anyone like to give thanks for the cup for the blood of Jesus shed for us? Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you showed us the depth of your love and the love of the Father for us, and that you were willing to obey him to go to the cross for us. Of our sins and for the promise of eternal life with you. Amen. 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 <coughs> we pass around. Thank you. <laughs> blood of Christ shed for us. So in this place of um, peace before the Lord, let's remember <coughs> those who need a special touch from him. We think again of Pam's family, for Mick and the rest of 
at the Lynn's family as they continue to really mourn the loss of Lynn and missing Lynn in their lives. For others that we all know who are feeling the pain of bereavement. And this morning we think of Sam and Margie who aren't able to be with us because of um, sickness and we pray that you will quickly bring restoration to both Sam and Margie. And also for Dave, for David and for Carolyn, Lord. If anyone would like to mention anyone else at this point, please do so. I wondered if Jan would pray for Margie because um, I talked with her this morning and she's back at the hospital tomorrow. Um, and once she's had cancer, there's always that worry and she's very aware of it. She seemed very positive. So she said, so I says, would you like us to pray for you? So we decided on a chance, very positive prayers would go down very well. <laughs> Lord, would you thank you Speak for Margie? Would you thank you for her determination, her cheerfulness, her always being there whenever she can and um, her steadfastness, Lord? We just pray that she would know your presence with her. Lord, that um, you will um, strengthen her and uphold her at this time of this illness. But more than this, Lord, we really pray this will be nothing serious and um, that she will soon recover and be better and back with us. Mm -hmm. We just ask this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 And Lord, as we have considered people that we know and are close to us, we think of situations in the wider world and the things that we see through our television screens. And Lord, we pray for the troubled situation in the Middle East and for all of the people affected by that. And for the situation in Ukraine, which is getting less attention because of the news for the Middle East at the moment, but continues to be uh, a, a, a place of great suffering in that war zone, Lord. And Lord, we, we know that there will be wars and rumours of wars. Your word tells us that, but Lord, we pray that you will lead to a path for peace, Lord. We don't know how that can work out, but Lord, we pray that you would guide the rulers of nations to uh, solutions to these times of conflict. Lord, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And shall we say the Lord's Prayer together? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. <coughs> sorry, oh, sorry, Jan. I'm giving you jobs to do when you've got others. Um, let's just. We've got the notices now. I was talking to, just before we get to the notices, I was talking to Julie Cottle yesterday and she was saying that she'd been up and looked and as far as she can and um, this is um, that the uh, new swales that have been built around the wind farm to collect water have collected huge yeah, amounts farm. of water, mm -hmm. the solar farm, yeah. have collected huge amounts of water and retained it up there and appear to be managing very carefully mm -hmm. the flow down into the village, which, uh, which if, um, if that's the case is a major source of relief to the biggest cause of anxiety to many in the village 
and um, one of whom uh, is, uh, <laughs> is, is here amongst us. And I was talking to Julie about it. Um, I, I really hope that that is a change in the environment because it's been something that hangs over the village as a whole, as, but particularly those people whose houses have been flooded, which is a, a most horrible experience to, to go through. But as I was um, preparing for this morning, I was reminded, and I think this is in 2019, the last time that Neil's um, house was flooded. Was that 2019? It's either 2018 or 2019, because the big flood was 2016, and then there was a, a smaller flood which affected him again just as they'd finished the house, I think in 2019. And I remember, and there's not many of us would have been here then, yet, yeah, just looking around, um, that most people who are in the room today or a good chunk came to the chapel after that. But I remember coming to the church on Sunday morning and we really feeling inspired that we needed to pray about the flooding situation in the village, that it was something that affected the village that shouldn't go on affecting the village. Now, um, uh, I realise that anyone can be extremely sceptical about all of that, but I'm just reminded to encourage us to pray for things in every situation, because it was something that in saying about the Holy Spirit leading us, it was something, uh, it doesn't, I'm not somebody who, who is always getting, oh, we need to pray about this or pray about that. But I checked with Jan this morning at the time. It was something that I came to church. To, we really need to pray about this flooding situation. And, um, you know, I pray now that this whole situation of the work they've done on the solar farm may indeed be an answer to that prayer and to the needs of the thing. And I know many people won't think that those are connected in any way, but that's... Um, we did. We do, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, uh, there we go. I only say I don't know what I say is. Let's listen to God's voice and pray for the things that He tells us to pray for. Yeah, and uh, that that's so important. So let's move on to our notices. So tomorrow, yeah. So please do stay for tea and coffee. We don't need to say that. We all know that, and we're all intended to. I'm sure. Um, we have a Bible study on Wednesday. The Chapel AGM is tomorrow at 7pm, so I know we have to collect Eugene and uh, we'll do that. Um, so that's tomorrow. AGM is a very grand term, um, but we'll obviously combine it with the normal meeting as well. But um, particularly, it, it's actually been quite interesting for me because I've prepared a report and Jan's prepared an annual report. And we need to appoint a new secretary, if we can, tomorrow, if that and also think about an assistant treasurer. But I think probably we talk about that tomorrow <laughs> rather than thinking we're going to resolve it t tomorrow. Okay. Uh, communion next week either? No, it's not communion next week. That's the bit I haven't changed. Mm -hmm. Next week, okay. thank you. Thank you for reading it carefully and pointing out <laughs> my, my mistakes. <laughs> yes, next Sunday. Is in fact, I should have just done it because next Sunday is Remembrance Sunday, which is the, uh, yes, next Sunday is the 12th. We're at All Saints. Um, we'll gather at the War Memorial for those who can, just before 11. And uh, it's usually about 5 2 when it starts. And then we walk up to All Saints and the service will be there. Um, and as is the custom, when it's there, I preach. And when it's here, someone from there preaches. So it's. Um, my turn to preach, so I'm afraid there's no change for you next week. <laughs> Except it's different because um, it's a bit more formal uh, preaching there than it than it is here. But uh, did you go to your songs? Yes, I was preaching at that as well. Oh, so right. I've been up and down that those pulpit steps. I'm knowing them. Right. I'm knowing them. Well. If you'd, if you'd go, I didn't know if anybody else. Yeah, there was there was a few few of us there. Margie was there. Margie was there. Sam was there. Yeah, Carol, was there. Carol was there. There was a few of us. There was a few of us there, yeah. Um, there were lots of people there. There was a lot of people there. Yes, there was a lot of people there, and I think it was a. It was a benefit, wasn't it, for the three churches? Yes. Over a hundred names, weren't they? But mainly from the other top of the houses there. In that you recognise most of most of them. Yeah, yeah, um, and perhaps. People from Yelvatov are quicker to send Michael Larder information than uh, people from outside because he was coordinating it. I don't know. Um, yeah. Can I just share about last Sunday? Yeah, of course you can. Because um, last Sunday, um, 
Sunday, I happened to be in Daventry in the morning. Um, I had to be there. And so, and I knew I wouldn't get back here. So I went to um, Church of the Holy Cross for the service. Which is a Roman Catholic church, isn't it? No, no, no. no. This is a church, church of England church. church. Yeah. It's a Church of England so church. It's a okay. Bit so sh- um, yes. Um, so we'd had um, a, a concert there the day before, and I was involved with that, so that's how I had to be back there for the next morning. But anyway, um, so I thought, oh, well, I'm here, you know, I'll go here. And oh, it was a bit of a shock. <laughs> <laughs> it seemed of being here and it seemed exceedingly ritualistic I yeah. suppose is the word I, I'm trying not to use but I can't get away from it yeah. and for me that did seem a huge distraction the fact that I felt I had to do everything at the right time I mean it's particularly because this morning I did everything at the wrong time <laughs> <laughs> My no, no, but it's great. <laughs> it is great because because yeah. actually there isn't a right time and a wrong no, time. Yeah, to put into practice what we talked about. No, yeah, it was just it was a wonderful exa- it was a wonderful example yeah. of, of of what matters and what doesn't yeah, matter. Exactly. It was so thank you for your illustration. <laughs> <laughs> No, I was just surprised. And then you think, but it's a challenge to me because, oh, yeah. I wasn't going to do that now. And, and you think, it doesn't matter. You know, it's kind of exactly yeah, what... The nice thing is, it, you know, I didn't then feel awful. I thought, oh, I have made a bit of a phone call, so never mind, I'll feel it's a learning curve. But if I'd have been in that church, perhaps, and done something that didn't fit in quite, I would have been... You know, in a bit of a dither, I think. <laughs> but um, it was a lovely service from the point of view of the music was beautiful. And they had quite a big band with different instruments, and I loved the music, and that put me at ease to a certain extent. But there was a lot of bowing and you know this sort of stuff that we we don't they do. Have incense. Pardon? They, have incense. they didn't have incense. No, it wasn't that high. But, <laughs> <laughs> Just turn the volume up a bit, so no problem. Yeah, okay. Yeah, my mum lived in Ravensthorpe, so she went to the church in Ravensthorpe, which is part of Gillsborough, and um, you know all the churches around there. So um, I always go there, and I took my friend Angie, who lives in Ravensthorpe as well, and lost her husband during COVID, and we went together. Last year it was Ravensthorpe, this year it was at Gillsborough, and um, it, it was it was nice. They had three people doing the service, doing different things, and it's, it's we're very welcoming there, there are quite a lot of people, and we all lit candles, um, so it was it was a nice experience for me, it was a very nice sermon, and there were three ladies did it, and uh, it, it's, it, was, it was good, it was enjoyable, so that's, yeah. that's what I had last night. <laughs> <laughs> was that more sort of service? Yeah. Was that lighting candles with people? Yeah, to remember people. Yeah, yeah same. It was, it was, yeah, for remembrance. Yeah, so we, again, we had a big list of people um, uh, that, that passed 
away from the different villages around there. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I have to say what I find interesting is because if you've got hundreds of people, you know, if you're running a cathedral, you can't avoid having to be quite structured and formed. Yeah, because it doesn't matter if, it, you know, if you go to a new church service, it won't be ritualistic in the same way, but it will still obviously be, um, in most cases, sort of planned out and uh, and and more rigid because just because of managing more people but um, I always found it I always find it really strange when people have to stick to that rigidity in a small setting I think you know the advantage that we have of being quite small is that we can then be flexible and informal and uh, and you can't do that we couldn't sit like this if there were 500 well we couldn't get in here at all if there were 500 of us here but it's right that we take advantage of what we are and but but you know if we and i pray that at some point there will be more people and younger people then what we are just like we were talking about we'll need to change to adapt to that as well and um, that's uh, you know that's all part of this sense of responding and being church in whatever way is right for us in that setting, isn't it? And uh, finding that right way. But that's the, that's the one thing, Jim, that I miss not living on the narrow boat. As you know, I used to disappear during the summer and uh, I, I became a spiritual gypsy going to different churches wherever we moored up over a weekend. Yeah. And, Sometimes it was Church of England, sometimes it was Methodist, sometimes it was Pentecostal. And the different ways that um, people worshipped was brilliant. But the one thing that I noticed right the way through it was when the preachers were preaching, things that I brought up in my, inverted commas, quiet time was very often answered by the preacher at that time. Yeah, and that would oh, that used to make the hairs on the back of my neck stand up, you know, because uh, I think, well, you know, this this guy is he doesn't know me, but he hit the nail on the head every time, and that to me was a guiding of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Bob. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? And, yeah. and different messages, that's all part of what we were talking about. The same message can speak different things to different people. And um, my prayer is always that the Holy Spirit speaks the right thing to each one, not that everybody yeah. gets what I'm trying to say, <laughs> but because that's not the important thing. It's that the Holy Spirit says to each one of us what he wants to say. Okay. <laughs> yes, now, Jan. <laughs> We've overrun it. Well, no, we haven't overrun. We've just taken a bit longer than usual. Oh, my. 